Well, thank you for the opportunity to present this work that I've been involved in with uh, looking at sphagnum responses in this large uh, climate change manipulation experiment uh, we're conducting in the United States. It's work uh, supported by the U.S. Department of Energy. And now in thinking about how to present this work in the context of the plants, people, planet, I think, well, you know, my whole career I've been working with plants, mostly trees, but, uh, and it's usually in the context of global change issues, global carbon cycle and global climate change. So that, of course, brings in the planet. But usually in our experiments, we deliberately exclude human influences. There's sort of a complication in the experiment. Um, nevertheless, of course, global change issues are caused by human activity, and plant responses are going to affect human, human um, everything. Um, so there is the, uh, the, the people aspect. And of course, uh, we, we know that human alteration of the the atmosphere and climate will compromise critical services that uh, terrestrial ecosystems provide, and carbon storage is one of those really critical ecosystem services. Now, various um, analyses of what the research priorities are for uh, understanding some of these issues have identified tropical forests and high latitude um, ecosystems as particularly important areas to research. Tropical forests, because the fluxes through of carbon and water through the systems are really huge. High latitude systems are especially important because of the large amount of carbon storage in the systems. And interestingly, this corresponds with this analysis of, um, of ancient and endangered forests, uh, tropical and boreal forests. And superimposed on here is the, uh, bore, the extent of the boreal forest, and the circle here is the location of our experiment in the, the very southern edge of the boreal forest. So these biomes are thought to be especially endangered. Um, now, the boreal uh, system contains large amount of um, peatlands, both um, in Arctic permafrost systems as well as uh, subarctic systems. And these systems contain a large amount of carbon that have been accumulating over centuries or millennia. Uh, considered sometimes as much as one third of the world's carbon, world's soil carbon, I should say. Uh, why does the carbon accumulate there? Well, the, the uh, peatlands are in cold, acidic, and waterlogged conditions that retard comp decomposition. However, the peatlands are considered especially vulnerable to climate change because the warming and drying associated with climate change can release a lot of the carbon that's been stored as CO2 or even worse, methane. Uh, therefore, northern peatlands could become a net source of carbon to the atmosphere and thereby exacerbating climate warming. Well, sphagnum moss is a, considered a keystone component of these peatlands. It's a, uh, sphagnum is the source of much of the accumulated carbon in the systems. And it's considered an ecosystem engineer because it's, it's really a pretty fascinating plant. As I said, I, most of my time I've worked with trees and sphagnum is, you know, a little bit smaller than trees. And I also worked a lot with tree roots and sphagnum doesn't have any roots. Nevertheless, it's a fascinating plant and I've really enjoyed getting to know it as part of this experiment. Ecosystem engineer because it's especially adapted to very low nutrient uh, situations. It acidifies the environment which keeps other competing plants out and its chemical composition retards its decomposition which is why it accumulates as peat moss. Uh, incidentally, it's, uh, I think, the first species that's been, was sequenced specifically for its role in uh, carbon cycling. So our experiment, called the spruce experiment for spruce and peatland responses under changing environments, it's a large scale, it's a long-term experiment. And the goal is to assess the response of a northern peatland high carbon ecosystem to whole ecosystem warming and elevated atmospheric CO2. As I said, it's situated in northern Minnesota at the southern edge of the boreal forest. Uh, you can see the bog here, surrounded by a lot of lakes. Uh, close up of the bog with the experimental chambers arrayed in it. Here's one of the chambers. Uh, it's a 12.8 uh, 12, 12 meter diameter, 7 meter tall chamber in which we can 
uh, warm the atmosphere and warm the soil in conjunction uh, in a controlled way. And you can see inside, a heavily instrumented uh, system inside. So it's a whole ecosystem warming approach. Um, you can see the, uh, well, we're using a regression-based design here, so, tip, so we're not just looking at is there a response to warming, but really look, trying to establish the response surface to warming, which is an approach that modelers in particular have really been pushing for for a long time. So we have a, a range of five different uh, temperatures, or warming, I should say, above ambient, um, and then that series of five is, is repeated in elevated CO2 as well. The um, objectives and, um, for this experiment is, first of all, to establish the response surface of sphagnum productivity to warming. Our basic hypothesis, based on what we've known before, is that sphagnum productivity will increase with modest warming of a few degrees and then decrease as warming increases. Secondly, we want to determine whether elevated CO2 alters the sphagnum response to warming. Uh, from what we know from previous experiments and just the basic physiology of, say, photosynthesis in sphagnum, which is more controlled by water, really, than CO2, we really ex didn't expect elevated CO2 to have a measurable effect on sphagnum growth or the response of sphagnum to the warming. And then thirdly, we're interested in uh, whether there's a, a change in the community composition of the sphagnum community. There are uh, basically three primary species of, um, of, of sphagnum in the site. Uh, two of them, sphagnum phalax and, and gustifolium, are really difficult to separate in the field, and they're phylogenetically really closely related. So we consider that as in just one unit. There's also sphagnum magellanicum, which tends to be on the top of the hummocks, you know, drier, warmer, in the drier places. In addition, there's a few other species of sphagnum in very small quantities and a little bit of polyctricum moss, um, which mostly is on the top of the drier hummocks. So our hypothesis with regard to the community composition is that the fractional representation of the Magellanicum, which is on these uh, warmer, drier places, and is, is um, it will, that its representation will decrease with warming because it is warmer and drier and the uh, climate change uh, treatments will exacerbate that. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the alternative hypothesis alter is that the um, Magellanicum is more adapted to warmer or drier conditions and therefore will benefit um, more than the uh, species in the wetter habitats. Well, here are the uh, approach on the community composition. Uh, we do this by laying out a transect, three transects within each chamber, and just do a visual inspection over a little five by five centimeter square uh, at places, specific places along this transect. So we can go year after year and look at the same spot. What we see is, well, and first of all, pre-treatment, before any of the treatment started, you can see the composition here across the bog. Uh, in the first year of treatment, uh, 2016, there was no response at all in the angustifolium phalax uh, fractional cover. There was weak evidence for a small decline in the Magellanicum. But in the next year, there was clear, uh, clear uh, evidence for a decline in the percentage of fractional coverage of both of those species. You can see the, the slopes here are pretty much parallel. And then that was even steeper in the third year such that, well, now, of course, although the slopes are similar, the uh, proportional, proportional loss of the Magellanicum is much less, and you can see that uh, in the warmer chambers, there was basically no Magellanicum left. But this is not a replacement of one species by another. The loss is really due to desiccation and loss of the sphagnum community as a whole uh, with warming, and you can see that here. This is showing the percent of area with no sphagnum uh, across the warming treatments. And you see an increasing in the second year in the hummocks, and uh, both in the hummocks and the hollows in the third year. Um, this, re this loss appears to be irreversible um, in that when it 
gets uh, wet again in the spring. We don't see any recovery of the system at all, and it's been increasing each year. So the next thing to look at is the growth of sphagnum in areas where it is actually growing. Now there's typical approaches or traditional approaches for measuring sphagnum growth using so-called crank wires or brush wires or other kinds of methods that really didn't work in this system. We really wanted to look at the uh, growth immediately after snow melt in the spring where it's hard to get in and, and uh, you know, make measurements. It's also, uh, you know, the old approaches really require the sphagnum growing up in a tight, uh, tight community and that's often not the case in this system. So we developed a system where, whereby we put a known length of sphagnum, seven centimeters, into these uh, columns, mesh columns, um, at the same density as in the bog, put it back in the bog and making sure there's a very close connection between what's in the column and the surrounding stuff, and then pull them out one year later and you can see the growth over that one year. And then we can weigh that and get a very direct measure of the sphagnum growth. Uh, in general, the angustiofolium, phalax, and the hollows, which is the orange, grew substantially more than the other than the species on the on the hummocks. But looking at the uh, sort of average of all of those, the cover weighted average in dry matter increment um, in ambient and elevated CO2, no response at all in 2016. 2017, um, there's a curvilinear response with the um, maximum occurring here at 19.5 degree C, which is about five degrees greater than the average growing season ambient temperature. But then in the third year, it's just a straight linear decline. And interestingly, here there's no separation between CO2 effects, but now, now the elevated CO2 plants have lower growth, uh, reduced growth compared to the uh, elevated, uh, compared to the ambient CO2 plots. Oh, and I didn't point out, a substantial amount of the growth occurs in very early spring, right after or maybe even before snow melt. Well, now when we combine the change in cover with the growth of places where it's growing, we can get a measure of the net primary productivity of sphagnum in this system. And that response is dominated by the loss in cover. Again, no response in the first year. In the second year, a linear decline and no, no difference in elevated CO2 and in the third year, a steeper decline um, and a separation with uh, less productivity in the elevated CO2, which is, of course, not what you'd expect in a vascular plant system. This uh, loss of MPP uh, based on the slope here is eight grams of carbon per meter squared per degree of temperature increase. And then this year, it's, it's uh, 29 or 13 degrees, depending on the elevated CO2. Now, the negative effect of elevated CO2 is a bit curious, and we expect it's an, it's an indirect effect of um, increasing shrub cover in response to the warming and maybe release of nutrients uh, that stimulate shrub growth and has an indirect effect back on the sphagnum. Now, that's work that is still continuing and needs to be documented better. I don't, it's hard to imagine a direct effect of CO2, direct negative effect of CO2 on the sphagnum. Well, uh, there's a lot of potential mechanisms where the temperature increase could be affecting the sphagnum productivity. We expect and can support the notion that it's primarily the effect on soil water. The warming is causing significant drying of the system. These systems are hydrologically isolated from the rest of the bog, so it's more similar to what would happen if the whole bog were being warmed. And, uh, you know, in a global change scenario. We have documented that the maximum depth to the water table increased with the warming, and the volumetric water content in the hummocks decreased with warming. Uh, so here we're plotting the MPP uh, on a reversed axis here of volumetric water content. So this is representing increasing temperature and increasing dryness, and you can see significant effects on MPP related to that, the water conditions. I also, of course, have with the warmer temperatures, uh, increased vapor pressure deficit at the high temperatures, which uh, leads to desiccation of the capitula through increased evaporation.
So the long-term consequences of this in this bog system could re be really quite severe. Uh, the loss is a substantial fraction of the MPP, about 41 percent uh, of the total system MPP uh, prior to the treatments was, was due to sphagnum. Uh, the, and the warming treatments have converted this ecosystem from one gaining carbon to one losing carbon. And that is represented here. This is for the whole ecosystem, but the sphagnum productivity is the substantial uh, contributor to this carbon loss. Uh, so the rapid decline, in conclusion, the rapid decline of the sphagnum community with sustained warming and this, as I said, it appears to be irreversible, can be expected to have a lot of follow-on consequences to the structure and function of this and presumably similar ecosystems. And that will provide significant feedbacks to the global carbon cycle and to climate change. So to summarize in a different way, responses to sphagnum are critically important to the structure and function of the peatland ecosystem. Human-caused changes in the climate will have a large impact on climate and the responses of sphagnum will have a larger scale impact on the global carbon cycle and to climate. So, plants, people, and planet.